Om Shanti, everyone. Can you hear me well? Great. So I will move straight into Baba's Murli because there is so much to cover. And I want to go over these different points carefully because it is really um, allowing us to um, look at this whole thing of self-sovereignty in a very um, detailed way, in a very deep way. So Baba, um, first of all, told us about self-sovereignty and he described that self-sovereignty in a way that we could understand it while being focused on it at the confluence age. So he said to us that the basis for the future world sovereignty is the self-sovereignty of the confluence age. So it's the self-sovereignty of what we are acquiring now. Then he took us into, he, he expanded on this and he said that we have a right to, so, to, to self-sovereignty. He didn't say you're making efforts for your self-sovereignty, but he said, you have a right to self-sovereignty in the confluence age. That was one thing. Based on this right to self-sovereignty, we get a right to world sovereignty in the future. So that was another thing. And then he said, because it is only through self-sovereignty that we can claim world sovereignty. So he then connected these two. Self-sovereignty happening at the confluence stage now, that becomes the basis for world sovereignty, which will be in the future. And then he reminded us, it is only through the self-sovereignty of the confluence age that we can claim the sovereignty of the world. Baba then said that to experience self-sovereignty at this time of the confluence age, it is the experience of our self-sovereignty in the now is a more elevated experience of our world sovereignty in the future. So I, you know, think about that. The experience of self-sovereignty at the confluence age now is a more elevated experience. It's more elevated than what we will be experiencing in the golden age, world sovereignty as our reward. So he was saying, look children, pay attention to self-sovereignty of the confluence age. That's the first self-sovereignty. And through this, remember that you're going to claim the right to the golden age and silver ages, which is a sovereignty over the entire world. Understand that. And then understand that in the copper and iron ages, there will be kingdoms, there will be sovereignties, but there will be state sovereignties, not world sovereignties. So when I was saying at the UN that when a country becomes independent, it is called a sovereign state. So that happens in the copper and iron ages. So we will have, they will be um, sovereigns of states. In the golden and silver ages, there will be world sovereigns. The rulers of the golden and silver age will have the whole world as their sovereign. It wouldn't be a state, but it will be world sovereign. And then at the confluence age, we have what is called self-sovereign, which is of ourselves. So then Baba expanded that all three, but it's self-sovereign, it is world sovereign, or it is state sovereign. They are kingdoms. 
And these kingdoms have one thing in common. All three of them have got one thing in common, and that is attainments of rights. And within the attainments of rights, we understand the system that gets created. So he says the governance systems are created through the attainment of your spiritual rights. So these government and governing and the Hindi word that Baba used was Raj Niti. So the Niti were like principles or the system and the governing is the Raj. And so he says, you now with the attainment that we're getting from Baba and we are forming or re-emerging our self-sovereignty, we are doing it through a system. It's not that we're doing it haphazardly or we're doing it, it's just happening as and how without rhyme and reason, but it is a specific system that we are following. And this system that we are following now at the Confluence Age to re-emerge our self-sovereignty becomes the foundational system, governing system for the golden and silver ages, the governing system for the copper and iron ages. And of course, because we are creating that, those systems for the golden age and the silver age and for the copper and iron ages, now when we re-emerging our self-sovereignty, we understand all three of these governing systems. Now that is very deep. That self-sovereignty I am creating now based on following this system of the confluence age allows me to understand the governing system of the golden and silver ages and of the copper and iron ages. And, but how much of that do we really grasp when Baba says, Swadarshan Chakradhari makes you into Chakravarti Raja. Swadarshan Chakradhari means when I spin that cycle of self-realization, which is self-sovereignty, I become the ruler of the world, which means I realize the system by which this whole world is governed from the confluence to the iron, from the confluence age to the iron age. So that was one thing that I wanted us to really use as the foundational understanding to what Baba uh, took us through when he says he started describing the system of the Confluence Age. And so what is this system of the Confluence Age? The system that helps us to re-emerge our self-sovereignty as a spiritual birthright. So when Baba says the attainment, the kingdom means the attainment of all rights. It's that when I claim my self-sovereignty as a spiritual birthright, and Baba is going to describe that to us, explain it to us. It means that I live in my self kingdom in which there is the attainment of all rights. I live in my self kingdom where I have the attainment of all rights. When I have the faith that self-sovereignty is my birthright. And Baba, of course, expands on that and explains it very beautifully. So the first, when we're looking at the system of the Confluence Age, what is that system? So Baba says the system of the Confluence Age is that each and every Brahmin becomes one who has sovereignty over the self. So the process 
and the system, they work together. So it is in a systematic way that every Brahmin soul becomes one who has sovereignty over the self. How is that? When we become Brahmins, we are also Raj yogis. So we don't say that we are Brahmins and finished at that, but we say we Brahmins are Raj yogis. To be a Raj yogi means, Baba says, to become a king. From a yogi, I'm becoming a Raja. So Raja Yogi is a systemic way of studying. It's a system. And I, the Raj Yogi, following this system of a Raj Yoga study, practice, dharna, and seva, I am becoming a king. So this is the, the confluence agent system is the system of Raj Yoga. The study, the practice, the dharna, and the seva are the four pillars of this system. And I'm moving from becoming a yogi into becoming a king. So this term that Baba uses, Raj Rishi, from a Rishi, a renunciate, which is a yogi, I'm becoming a Raja, a king. So he says that, the right to self-sovereignty means that I have recognized this special system that I have entered into when I become a Raj Yogi. So that is so beautiful. When the right to self-sovereignty occurs when I, the Brahmin, recognize that I am a Raj Yogi, who have entered this system of the study, the practice, the dharna and the seva of Raj Yoga. So what is this system that I have recognized? What is this special system that will now emerge from me, my self-sovereignty, my true self-sovereignty? that would take me, that would return me to this self-sovereignty. This special system will do that if I follow it. If I follow it the way Baba is guiding me to follow it, I will return to my self-sovereignty. And so the system, he says, of self-sovereignty is for one's self. What does that mean? The system for, of self-sovereignty is for one's self. It means I have to do it for myself. No one else can do it for me. I have to walk the path. I have to do the realizing. I, it's for oneself then. The work has to be done in the laboratory, in the lab of my own soul. And I have to be the one experimenting with this special system. So he says that because the soul is the only soul, it's the only being who will have a right over its own mind, its own intellect, its own sanskaras, and all its physical organs. The soul living in this body is the only being who will have that right over the way it its mind, its intellect, and its inspired, and over all its physical organs. No one else will have a right to do that. So the system begins with this recognition that only I can do it for myself because this is my own kingdom. And then Baba went into this whole explanation um, of giving us the example of how this happens. How does it happen? How? Does this system work within the context of me taking on the responsibility of being a self-sovereign and working with my mind, working with my intellect, 
working with my sense paris and working with all my organs. So he gave us the analogy of a king and his service companions or his subjects. And the king now orders his companions and his subjects to carry out a task. Now, this is an interesting thing. If I live and work in a kingdom and the king is asking me to carry out a task on his behalf, I wouldn't just take that task and carry it out in any way. I will have to take that task and carry it out in alignment with the system and customs of that kingdom. Nowadays, if we are working in a company and we are given a project to do in the company, I will have to carry out that project according to the vision and the mission and the values of the company. I just can't do it in any old way, in my own way. So Baba said that as this is what's happening for a soul who has a right to self-sovereignty. So if I have a right to self-sovereignty and I'm giving orders to my mind, to my intellect, to my sanskaras, or to my physical organs, I will carry that, I will give that order with the power of yoga. Because the system of Raj Yoga works with the power of yoga. If I do not, as the self-sovereign, work with my mind, intellect, and sanskaris, and my physical organs, if I do not work with the power of yoga, they will not function under my orders. They will be out of control. And so that's the first thing that the system operates with, and that's the power of yoga. Also, Baba says, the second thing that it functions with this system is directions. So I have the power of yoga, but I also need to know what directions I need to give to my mind, intellects, and scars and my physical organs so that they will function in an ordinary, ordinary manner. So those directions are not just my own desires or what I need or what I want. But as a self-sovereign, those directions will be according to what Baba is telling me, according to Baba's Srimad. So the system here, the first two things to really hold very as, as essential um, ingredients for the system to work well is the power of yoga, and the second is the directions. So now, how will it work? You know, I, I know this, but what is it that Bobby's is drawing my attention to make it easy um, for this system to work? So he then said that the most important power that makes this system work uh, effectively is the power of thought. And so the practice here with the power of yoga and with the directions, before I even um, you know, instruct my workers, which is my mind, intellect, and sense cars, or my physical organs to function or to do anything, the soul, the self-sovereign needs to do something. And what the self-sovereign needs to do is to stabilize the mind, which means to bring all the thoughts because the mind is connected to the physical senses. So the self-sovereign will bring all the thoughts and will stabilize that mind and will do that through 
concentration of thoughts, which is most probably man manabha, in which I am focusing all my thoughts in remembrance of one, and that is the way to stabilize the mind and to bring power into my thought. And this practice for the self-sovereign is that the self-sovereign will be able to do it anywhere and wherever they want. Wherever you are, whatever, um, whenever you want, you will be able to do this practice. And he says, this indicates, if I'm able to do that, it indicates that the self sovereign, that the soul has sovereignty over these three abilities. Just this one practice, if I'm able with the power of my thought, concentrate on Baba, stabilize the mind, it indicates that I have sovereignty over my mind, intellect, and sanskaras. Because it shows that I'm not subservient to my sanskaras, but I am able to control my sanskaras. And not only do I control my sanskaras, but I'm able to connect my sanskaras to elevated principles. So as I said on Sunday when I was reading the Murli, that a self-sovereign just doesn't work with the mind. It may stabilize the mind. It may get the mind to become still and powerful, but it is still the sanskaras that the self-sovereign is working with. And the self-sovereign is working with sanskaras at the level of elevating those sanskaras. They are working with sanskaras that are divine sanskaras. And then they are connecting the godly principles. Remember, it's still a system they're working through. So the system of Raj Yoga is based on godly principles. So they are connecting those godly principles to their sanskaras. So one of the godly principles, for instance, would be be a bestower of happiness. So that's an elevated principle for my sanskara. I am a bestower of happiness. I'm a merciful soul. So those are called elevated principles. So now if a sanskara is emerging, that is going to take me out of control, that is going to disempower my mind and my intellect, will, my mind will start, my thoughts will start racing all over and I, I make me weak. I can bring back my thoughts and connect them to my elevated principle of who I am according to my काम क्रोध मद लोभ मोह वश आज है सब मोहताज योग लगा कर पाप मिटा ले स्वर्ग सजा ले तू आज काम क्रोध मद लोभ मोह वश आज है सब मोहताज योग लगा कर पाप मिटा ले स्वर्ग सजा ले तू आज
अविनाशिया तुम सुन लो मेरी आवाज योगी बनो जानी बनो योगी जीवन है प्यारा So as I was saying that I'm able to connect that sanskara to an elevated principle and then that sanskara will direct the quality of thoughts I should have. Otherwise, I will be trying to create positive thoughts to erase the negative thoughts, but my sanskaras will still interfere and I won't be a self-sovereign because I will be out of control. I will be going back and forth, back and forth, only at the level of my thoughts. So Baba says, stabilize the mind, but use the elevated principles and connect them to the sanskaras. And let your sanskaras determine what your awareness would be. And so that would indicate that I'm a self-sovereign which is very beautiful. So Baba said, then Baba talked about um, how we are deceived by our physical senses. And he says that sometimes our eyes would deceive us and sometimes our words would deceive us. And he was saying that we, this only happens, our eyes, which is very subtle, our words, which are not so subtle, they can only deceive us, he says, if our sanskaras are not under our control. So we have to remember that, that if I see something and I'm deceived by it, or if words are spoken and they deceive me, I didn't mean to say them, I have to check my sanskaras. And as a self-sovereign, I need to return to those sanskaras that are divine. In other words, that, are, that would function on those elevated principles. And Baba, of course, gives us every day, we could have a list from the Murli of the elevated principles by which we have to live. And it's called dharna, the dharna that we have to live by. Then Baba says that, um, he went on to this whole area of telling us that self-sovereignty is a right. Um, it is not an effort maker. So self-sovereignty is a spiritual right. It's a spiritual birthright. Self-sovereignty is not an effort maker. And he was making, convincing us actually, he was telling us in a very way, he was reaffirming within us by each and every word he was uh, uh, explaining, using to explain to us that opt for the side of self-sovereignty being a birthright and not, you know, go onto the side that I have to make effort in order to become a self-sovereign. Stay with the easy, stay with the simple, stay with the truth 
and that is self-sovereignty, it's your birthright. But how do we, in other words, be inspired? You see, this is the difference between being inspired and being motivated. If I see self-sovereignty as my birthright, and I know I have the faith that Baba is saying that to me, and all I have to do is follow the principles, follow the directions, follow the practice um, in the way he has explained it, understanding the system of Raj Yoga, then it will, I will naturally return to it. And that's called inspiration. I'm being inspired to return to that which I have. But motivational is more, someone else has told me something and I'm motivated to experiment with it. So that's an effort maker. So Baba wants us to see it more as something that is inspirational. And so he is saying that if I establish within me an awareness that self-sovereignty is my birthright, that in and of itself would prevent me from being deceived by my physical organs or by my mind intellect or and sanskaras, just that awareness, he says, would stop me from being deceived. Because he says, I will be living in that recognition of what my birthright is. So I will have a right that would naturally emerge out of that awareness of self-sovereignty. And that becomes like a safety for me not to be deceived. So um, how do we do that? I suppose just by saying that I am a soul, just that practice of considering yourself to be a soul and you are a yogi, 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 and you are studying Raj Yoga to do that would remove the deception that would otherwise be created and block our awareness and stop us from being self-sovereign. So just the simple practice, just bringing that back into awareness means that we will never become subservient to any form of body consciousness. Because he says that subservience, the way he described subservience, if a soul is subservient, it means the soul's awareness is I have to make effort in order to claim my right. So that was an interesting thing for me that usually subservient um, is, is uh, explained as I am a victim to something or someone, or I feel I lack something. And so I'm subservient to that weakness, or I want something from someone. And so I'm subservient to that person because I need that person to fulfill something in me. But Baba was describing that if I see myself as an effort maker and I have to make right, um, I have to make effort to claim that right, then that soul is subservient. So I thought that was an interesting thing for us to look at within our own efforts, that God is my father and I'm still having to beg him for something or I'm still having to make effort to claim something, or God is my father and my birthright is self-sovereignty. And all I have to do is to return to that sovereignty through following the system that he has established, which is called Raj Yoga. So then Baba told us, of course, that we will experience the spiritual intoxication if we are living in the self-sovereignty as a right. But he says what we will be experiencing inside of us is that we will be experiencing in our inner selves a kingdom that is free from sorrow. 
It's as if we are living in this land of soul consciousness and the land of soul consciousness is a land that's free from sorrow. And I, the soul, I am a carefree emperor living in my land of soul consciousness. And he, he then went on to describe that we won't have any worry because the moment we worry, we will experience sorrow. So we will be carefree kings, no worries, because everything is accurate in drama. What is there to worry about? And secondly, I wouldn't be experiencing any sorrow that would emerge out of that worry. So Baba then said that would be one of the ways also that I would recognize that I'm living within the system of Raj Yoga. He also said that um, I would feel that um, not only that is my inner state of soul consciousness free from sorrow, but it is also a place that generates happiness. So if my inner state of soul consciousness is free from sorrow, what else can happen but that feeling of happiness? So soul consciousness is where happiness emerges out of um, because it's not a place that sorrow grows in. So um, then, of course, Baba went on to talk about, he was saying um, from the intoxication that you get from living in this inner state of, or this land that is free from sorrow, you will then experience sovereignty in a very happy way. He calls it an intoxicated self-sovereignty. And you will feel that you are seated on your immortal throne. And so he was asking us, what is that immortal throne that we will be sitting on? And he says, you will sit on that throne but you will be in a state of spiritual intoxication. So how do I know I'm sitting on an immortal throne? Is that I, the soul, will be experiencing spiritual intoxication. And he also talked about the, um, where did you get this, um, you know, this throne from? He says, the moment you became a Brahmin, the father himself seated you on this throne. And so that meant when he seated us on the throne, and of course we always think when we hear Baba talk about immortal thrones, of course it's the center of the forehead, but when the father seats me on the throne, it's usually the throne of his heart. And so he says that for him, we then become this child that is like a king. And, you know, he uses this beautiful Hindi term, Raja Beta. And so he says that in the world, even though people may call their, chi their child the golden child or the kingly child that has entered the family, the parents still don't have a control of what that child will be in terms of when the child grow up. But for Baba, when Baba calls us Raja Beta, he sees us as Rajogis. And from that moment on, in a practical way, Baba sees us with that vision. The vision never wavers. No matter what is the level we may be, for Baba, he always sees us as that Rajogi that kingly child. And I, this, is, this is how God's vision differs from a human being's vision. Because a human being vision, when they are looking at another human being, would see everything about the human being. But when Baba looks at us, from the moment he places us on his heart throne, on that throne of being a Raj Yogi, he always sees us as his Raja Beta, as his kingly child, because he sees us as Raj Yogis and he sees us living within the system of moving from a Yogi to becoming a Raja, to becoming a self-sovereign. 
So Baba then reminded us, remember what this system of self-sovereignty is all about. And the system of self-sovereignty here at the Confluence Age is to rule the self, is to have a right over every physical organ. It's to first think of something, then speak of it, and then see it. So this is part of the system. I repeat it because it's so beautiful. What is this system of self-sovereignty at the confluence age? Is to rule over all the physical organs, is to rule over the subtle organs, the mind, intellect, and sense cars, is to remember you first think of something, then you speak about it, and then you see it. So these three steps is part of the system. And so he says that when you are dealing with your physical organs, remember this. You first think of something, then you speak of it, and then you see it. So he's saying that, you know, our eyes are open, so we're always seeing things. So um, we shouldn't be, oh my God, I just saw something, but I shouldn't have seen it because now it's left such an impact on me. He says, no, you can't do that. You have to have rulership over that, those eyes. Then he says, the ears are like doors, but they don't have stoppers. So we're constantly listening to conversations, but he's saying, know how to use your ears and how to stop things from entering them that would leave an impact on you. And so then he was saying, um, you know, this, this uh, ornament or this decoration, hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, but we should also think no evil because it is the, when we have all four line up and in alignment, it is then, and then he introduced two other powers that belong to this system of the confluence age of self-sovereignty. Two other powers that the self-sovereign need to control and rule over those senses, the physical senses and the subtle abilities of controlling power and ruling power, because this is what a king needs to have in a kingdom. And so Baba was saying self-sovereignty means ruling power and controlling power. Uh, because if we do not have it, nobody would, not even myself, my mind, intellect, and sense cars, or my physical senses wouldn't accept me as the ruler of them. They wouldn't do what I want them to do. So, um, and for ruling and controlling power, Baba was saying that we need the power to discern. We need discernment because mistakes, remember what he said, he says, a mistake is only made when something is not according to the system. Mistakes are only made when something is not according to the system. So when we look at the system of the yagya, that when I don't follow the systems of the yagya, I can make a big mistake. But what about the system of the mind, intellect, and senses and my physical senses? If I don't um, use these, uh, these things according to the system of Raj Yoga, then I will make a mistake. And so Baba is saying that I must understand what I should do and should not do what is accurate and what is not inaccurate and what is wasteful. And in this deeper understanding, I must be able to control it. But what is happening is that I know what is right and wrong. I know what is true and false. I know what is accurate and inaccurate. I know what is waste and what is not but I'm not able to control it. And so it means that controlling power is lacking. So I have to kind of 
look at myself to make sure that when this happens, why was I not able to control it, even though I knew, I understood, but still I wasn't able to control my eyes from seeing in a certain way, from my mind thinking in a certain way, from my ears listening in a certain way, from my mouth speaking in a certain way. Why was there that lack of control power? So then Baba gave the example of the car and the brakes. And he says that, you know, the most important thing in a car is its brakes and accidents are made when the brakes are not applied at the right time. And so he was saying, we should check this, that um, with my controlling power, am I able to apply that brake at the time it needs to stop the waste? Before I think something wrong, am I able to use the controlling power to stop that thought and to transform it into a thought that would be something right? So he says, if I'm able to do this, this is called controlling power. And so he says, do not, this is also, controlling power is also a way to help me eliminate my wasting of time. So he was saying that don't um, know, he gave this beautiful example that I know I checked and I know that this is something that I shouldn't do or shouldn't think. So I apply the break and I stopped it, but it took me half an hour longer before I could transform that thought that I applied the break to and make it something right. So Baba is saying, then that means that there is not the controlling power or even further, I may be able to control it, but I'm not able to be the ruler who will transform it into something right. And this was another way, he says, we become subservient. And this subserviency is when there is the mixture of what I know I need to do, but I'm not doing it. So this is a subserviency. So I thought that was very interesting. So Baba was saying, so that makes us into effort makers because we're not doing it in the right at the right time that we should be doing it. And so we become then effort makers. And we don't, what we justify it by saying is, you know, I'm just an effort maker. I'm just an effort maker. I'm not a master as yet. So he was saying that to be in the pleasure of a self-sovereign means change it around and say, I'm not an effort maker, but I'm a master of the self. And this will help us because the intoxication, the ability to know I could do something different, I can be something different in the moment I can be it, gives me a great sense of being a self-sovereign. So Baba was then, he, he, um, re, um, you know, he kept repeating these um, beautiful statements, but in different ways, but the, the repetition is, he kept bringing us back to the system. So he was saying that if we could understand the system of self-sovereignty, then we will be able to understand the system of world sovereignty. And so the Confluence Age is not about world sovereignty. The Confluence Age is all about self-sovereignty. So we should spend a lot of time really experimenting with it, understanding it, practicing it, um, and returning to that state of, I am the master of myself. No one else can bring me to that state, but to myself. The rewards will be in the golden age, in the silver age, and we may even have state sovereignties in the copper age and iron age, but that is a result of what I am doing with who I am at the Confluence Age. And what I'm doing 
is I'm claiming that birthright of self-sovereignty at the Confluence Age. And then Baba talked a little bit about the Golden Age. And he says that the system of the Golden Age is a family that functions with love and with relationships. So he was saying that the king and the queen, of course, the emperor and empresses, empress will be there, but he says the subjects will also have that feeling that they belong to one family. And I love this when he says the Raj Niti, the governing system of the golden and silver age, ages is a system of family. Everyone will feel connected to the other from the king, from the emperor, right down to the subject, will feel that sense of a greater belonging, that they belong to one family. And another beautiful thing he says, and I think of Brahma Baba when he say this, when he said this, and that is the emperor will be like a supremely loving father. That means the emperor will care for each and every person belonging to the land called the golden age. And so I thought that was so very, very beautiful. Even the work there, the, the, the tasks that people will carry out in the golden age will be done as a family, will be done with the love of a family. And of course, he says the wealth there is available to each and every one, of course, but they will take based on the rewards that they have earned from the Confluence Age. They won't take more or less, but it would all be available to them. Um, you know, the basic things in life, but also nature will provide everything. So it, it, it was such a beautiful image that Baba painted of the Golden Age. And then in contrast to that, the governing system of the copper and iron ages is according to law and order, because that would be state sovereignty. And so Baba made this contrast for us to understand um, what is being uh, world sovereign, what is being state sovereign in terms of how the systems would run because the copper and iron, the copper and iron ages would be according to the laws of the land. The, the golden and silver ages would be on the law of love and family. And so Baba is saying that, but that the confluence age, the system is of love and Srimat. It's love and godly directions. And so Baba went into that, that um, we must continue to follow the Srimat. And so when we follow the Srimat here, it becomes the natural law of the golden age. And there will be no need to give strict orders there because the Srimat is a natural form of governance. And so when we go to the golden age, we won't have to tell anyone what to do. It will love, will put everything in order. And so that this Srimat of being loving now at the confluence age, love and Srimat, it will remove, um, remove all the, the harshness from the laws that will be followed. So then Baba um, also talk about um, how the confluence age is the age that makes us full. And we become full of prosperity, but it is a prosperity that we receive from Baba. And it is a prosperity that lasts us from birth after birth. And this is why the self-sovereignty of the confluence age is where the most attention should be paid to because all the rest, the rest on this. And then um, Baba then asks us to maintain this intoxication, which is very beautiful of our Brahmin birth. 
and he was saying the intoxication that we should maintain of the Brahmin birth is the Raj Yogi, of course. When I say I'm a Brahmin, I'm also a Raj Yogi. And I have the Tilak as a Brahmin. Baba himself, Father Brahma himself gave me this Tilak of self-sovereignty the moment I took birth. And so what is this Tilak? I'll be saying the Tilak is about the awareness of who I am. So I have the Tilak, I have the crown, I have the throne. And so he was saying the crown is of course world benefit. We are world benefactors. So that the Tilak is the awareness of being a world benefactor, of being one who brings um, benefit to the whole world. That's the crown I'm wearing, and that's the awareness that is in my um, is inside of me. But also, he says, I have this double crown, and this double crown is of purity. So one is a world benefactor, but the other is of purity. And of course, the purity is of light, um, of Baba's remembrance, because when I'm in Baba's remembrance, I'm pure. When I'm pure, there is this crown of light. And then the second level of the crown, which makes it a double crown, is of uh, being a world benefactor. And I liked it when he said that, don't think of yourself as belonging to a particular state. If I have the awareness, I am of Gujarat, or I am of Delhi, or I am of New York, or I am of Connecticut, or I am of whatever state you happen to be in, and you're serving that state, it means you're coming back into the Copper and Iron Age because that's where state sovereignty is. But if you wear this double crown with your tilak of awareness on the throne of Baba's heart, you will then be seeing that whatever I'm doing, I may be acting locally, but I'm doing it for the whole world. Whatever I'm doing, I'm doing for the whole world. And so he says, don't become a state sovereign because you would end up in the copper age or the iron age. But he says that um, to be stabilized in these three things of our awareness, the tilak, of our double crown and of our throne. And uh, finally, I think that um, I would, what I would share is that um, Baba is saying that um, we must um, remember that it is something easy to return to our self-sovereignty. What we have to do to make it easy is to remain in the intoxication that self-sovereignty is my birthright. I have to understand this at the level of experiencing the importance of this in my life. And that would raise my self-esteem. It would raise my um, self-respect. It will raise my understanding of who I am when I say I'm a Brahmin or a Brahma Kumar or a Brahma Kumari, or when I say I'm a Raj Yogi, because I belong to this whole system and this system is taking me systematically back to my self-sovereignty. I must remember that in doing that, I will have a right to this kingdom of self-sovereignty. And then he says, don't think of yourself as a effort maker. Just think of yourself as a self-sovereign. And self-sovereignty is your birthright. Why? Because God gave it to you directly. What more do you want? Are you all self-sovereigns now? Is there anything I left out from the revision? No, you could write it in the chat. 
there's so much, you know, that the Murley has. And sometimes I think, what should I review with them and what should I leave out? And the moment I think that I should leave this out and not say this, I said, no, if I leave it out, then they wouldn't get the fullness of what Baba said. You know, like being subservient. Uh, you know, if I have to make effort for something, he says, that's a form of subservience. Isn't that something new? But if I say, you know, it's mine, Baba has given it to me, but I'm just not using it. Let me use it. Let me remember to use it. That's not subservience. And that was something new that I didn't even pick up on Sunday. But when I was reading it back, this is the thing about reading Baba's Murli over and over again. You keep picking up the subtleties of what these points are saying to us. And the soul is like absorbing the subtleties of these points. Okay, so there are there are nothing there are no chats today in the chat box, so that means you are all self sovereigns, right? You're all masters of the self. Um, the, uh, the question is, do I talk to my sense organs with love or with order? With love as the system, but as a master. Okay, a master, as I understand it, what Baba is saying, a master will never use force. So the master will understand the principles. So when you are talking to your subtle friends, which means your subtle companions, your mind, intellect, or sense cars, or you're talking to your physical organs, the master will connect to the principles. And the master will use the principles with love. So for instance, love is a law, but you don't use the law of love with force. You use the law of love with gentleness. You use the law of love with understanding you use the law of love with grace, with patience. So law, love is the law, but the way it is used is what is important. And remember my mind, intellect and sense cars or my physical organs do not cooperate with me if I'm lawful with them. They resist anything that is lawful or force. They're just not going to cooperate with me. But if I use love and Shrima, love first, and then I'm following the system, Shrima is the system of Raj Yoga. Srimat is what I have to follow in the system of Raj Yoga. And I have to do it with love. I have to follow this path of truth with love. And so that's how I would do it. As a master, that makes me a master. And so even if I'm using my controlling power and ruling power, I'm doing it as a master. I'm doing it with gentleness. I'm doing it under the guidance of Baba. And you see, this is the beautiful thing. Baba never forces us to do anything. Baba cajoles us. Baba talks to us so gently. Baba tells us the same things every single day. 
Baba is so patient with us. Baba shows us his humility. And that's how he wants us to work with ourselves too. So I would work with myself in exactly the way Baba works with me. And that makes me a master. Okay. All right. So I think you've had enough of me for one evening. So now let us remember Baba and let us um, do some meditation together. And then you go into the Abhyakti Parivar segment for this evening. Om Shanti. Tapati man ko meri Atma tripti meli Bujh rahe deep ko Jaisi deepti meli Tapati man ko meri Atma tripti meli Bujh rahe deep ko Jaisi deepti meli Jab padi aap ki Drishti ham par prabhu Jab padi aap ki Drishti ham par prabhu Jaisi jeevan mila Jyoti jagti mili Jaisi jeevan mila Jyoti jagti mili Jaisi jeevan mila Jyoti jagti mili Tapti man ko mere Om Shanti. Om Shanti. Thank you, Sister Gayatri. Thank you.